Hi guys, it's Jazz here and welcome to episode 33 of the Protrusive Dental Podcast. We're talking about airway. Now airway for me, what I think is that in dentistry, it really is the elephant in the room. Like we qualify from dental school and this mammoth topic of airway and how relevant it is to dentistry. I mean, come on, we're looking down the mouth. We got a huge view of the airway uh, and it's something that's completely neglected in dental education. But the more I sort of delve deeper into this, it's actually neglected in medical education as well. But it was sort of turning that around slowly so that me and Prof. Amma Johan, who was the guest today, were thinking that perhaps in 10 years' time, it's going to have its rightful place near towards the top of, of what we learn at dental school and at medical school for that fact. So we're talking about what is the elephant in the room and its airway. The way that I got into airway in my journey is something I discussed with Prof. Emma Johau is that when I was a DCT1 at Guy's Hostel, I'd have like this one clinic like every two weeks where I'd be making these mandibular repositioning appliances. And they were like, uh, it's like a soft splint for the top, a soft splint for the bottom, and they're sort of glued together with a mandible in a slight, slightly protruded uh, position, what Prof. Amma Johau describes it very much as a first generation appliance. So that was my first real exposure into treating the airway or treating sleep disordered breathing for that fact. And uh, when I learned some years later that there is an association between sleep apnea and power function, you know, that got me excited, uh, which hardly surprised any of you. I know, I know that for a fact. So I'm really, really stoked to have Prof. Emma Johal. We recorded this episode in about April. We're now in July. So the sort of vibes you'll be getting is like, oh my God, it's lockdown kind of thing. But it's it's full of a lot of useful information. This, this episode here is really to whet your appetite about airway and the role that dentists and the dental team can play in spotting sleep disordered breathing, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, and obviously treating snoring as well, actually, which goes hand in hand. And you'll learn about the sort of definitions, what role we have, what works and what doesn't work, the different oral appliances. So really cool episode. I hope you like it. Very niche, very different. Something that really needs to get out there some more. The protrusive dental pearl I have for you today was donated by my good colleague, Tristan. Tristan's been listening to the podcast some time. It's been great to connect with him on Instagram. And I like many of you uh, that listen to the podcast and I've made so many friends to this. So thanks so much, Tristan, for reaching out. And Tristan uh, reached out to me and said, like, Jazz, I've got like the next pearl for you. It's basically when you're doing rubber dam, instead of using floss, use the little flossettes. And you know me, I was like, Tristan, um, I've kind of been doing this for three years. But then Tristan threw in this absolute knowledge bomb that is definitely going to change the way I now uh, place rubber dam. And I think it's going to—it's a really helpful tip. So what, what I usually do in my workflow for rubber dam is um, I hold it in place. Uh, I try and stretch it into the contacts if I can, but a lot of the contacts are tight and they need flossing, right? So uh, I train my nurses on how to floss effectively. Um, sometimes people get their nurses to hold the rubber dam and the dentist flosses whatever. So um, the nurse is flossing, but when I switched to using the flossettes, it became so much easier. The nurse found it so much easier, especially to reach like between the, the first and second molar. It's so much easier. But the, what Tristan shared with me, which is the real protrusive dental pearl for today, is to buy the flossettes, which have a double floss. So they have like one higher up and then one lower down. Because quite often when you're flossing the rubber dam through the contact, it actually misses or it doesn't quite drag the rubber dam past the contact area sufficiently. So having that second floss in the flossette gives you a second bite of the cherry. So then you don't have to keep flossing. So uh, thank you, Tristan, for donating that protrusive dental pearl today. We'll dive right into the episode with Prof. Amma Johal and uh, join me back in the outro. Prof. Amma Johal, uh, it's great to have you on the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you? Very good, thank you. Yeah, yeah interesting times we're living in, but yeah, really good, thanks. Absolutely. So to put some context in for those watching or listening, we are in the middle, or it's end of April now, 2020, and we're in the middle of the sort of COVID-19 lockdown period. So how are you keeping busy at the moment? Um, and then maybe it's a good point for you to tell, because I, I usually like to do a little introduction for someone. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But before I give my little uh, introduction of you, can you please tell the listeners what you've been up to and what you're usually up to when you're not in a lockdown period? Okay, so um, so my, if you like, daytime job is as professor of orthodontics, um, training undergraduates, postgraduates, and specialist orthodontic treatment. Um, in addition to that, I work as a consultant for Bart's charity, Bart's trust, I should say, not charity, although it is like a charity, um, <laughs> treating patients with you know multiple complex needs. Um, and then I suppose a proportion of my week is spent in private practice. So treating 
sleep disorder breathing, which I also treat at the hospital, and as a specialist orthodontist. Um, so yeah, my week is really quite busy, actually. It's pretty full on. Um, lockdown has actually meant for us just really getting on with an awful lot more academic work. So I'm doing a lot of um, academia. We have a lot of students and probably you're aware of the challenges of presenting their assessments for them during mm. this kind of lockdown period. Um, from the NHS side, I've been redeployed and I'm working uh, in A&E, which is a very, very interesting place to be right now. Um, so we're very much at the, the front line. Um, that's been quite interesting. But again, I've managed to kind of relate a little bit of my respiratory uh, understanding. Um, so as you probably read, one of the treatments for some of these patients is is one of the treatments we're going to talk about this afternoon. So it's been, yeah, I've kind of enjoyed it, but found it a little bit out of the comfort zone, let's say. Well, it sounds like you've been very busy indeed, not only with the academia, but with the, this great role that you're doing as a, you know, as a working on the front line. So I think a, a thank you from our profession to, 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 to people like you and my wife who's also sort of assistant swabber for COVID-19 and everyone who's yeah. um, you know, being redeployed. It's, it's great stuff. So my version of your introduction is you are, so Prof Amajoha, you are someone who, you were, you were quite famous in my orthodontic diploma that I did. Because um, every time we'd see like, uh, oh, what's the reference for that one? You know, when we're revising for exams mm. and we all had a little in joke that if you just reference um, Johal Atal, you're probably going to get the mark. So that was, that was what you were famous for. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tell us, uh, so we're going to talk about uh, airway and um, obstructive sleep apnea and sleep uh, disordered uh, breathing. How did yeah. you get into uh, this sort of micro niche within uh, dentistry? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it was very unique because um, when I was training as an orthodontist, um, Joanna Battergell, who was a senior lecturer at Barts, um, developed this initial interest in sleep medicine. And because of the MSc that I was doing at the time, she sort of wrote me into it with her. And so it's been almost 25, well, just over 25 years, actually, I've been involved in research and clinical work. So um, yeah, it's kind of escalated from there. And now we've run a sort of a PhD program. I took on a PhD in dental sleep medicine, um, which was, you know, interesting and fairly novel at the time, actually. So, um, yeah, that's where my interest really was born out of academia. And then I started to manage and treat these patients. Um, and, I, you know, as a profession, I think it's incredibly exciting. I mean, the opportunities for us to, to shine are amazing. I think it's, a, it's one of those, I mean, at dental school, I was always taught that there are two chances you can uh, save someone's life. One is uh, oral cancer, if you diagnose it. And two is actually a uh, gastric osteophageal reflux disease, because if you, you know, Barrett's yeah. esophagus. But then uh, no one ever mentioned the third one, which was uh, obstructive sleep apnea and the role of, of dentistry. So I think that leads us nicely onto one of my main questions. Can you firstly give us an overview to all the dentists watching, you know, lots of GDPs uh, listening into this? What is obstructive sleep apnea or sleep disordered breathing and what is the role of the d dentist in the diagnosis and management at the moment and perhaps what you think it could be in the future okay really good question really so um the sort of global term that's often applied is is, is a term referred to as sleep related breathing disorders or sleep disorder breathing and, and that covers a panacea of, of of challenges so I suppose if we go back very briefly to the anatomy of the area of interest, we're talking about the back of the throat. So that the, the, really the point from where you see your dangling soft palate to the base of the tongue. And this is a very small piece of anatomy. And the analogy I often give um, dental colleagues who come on courses and so forth is to think of a, a, like a party balloon, long and thin. And if you inflate it, it stays inflated. Otherwise, it's, it's just completely collapsible. And that is your upper airway. So what makes it quite unique is it's devoid of any sort of skeletal framework. And it relies almost entirely on muscle action to keep it patent. So sleep-related breathing disorders is, is essentially dealing with either a partial or a complete collapse of that airway, that small tissue um, area. And so at one extreme, we talk about snoring. Uh, and snoring is obviously quite a... a you know, people laugh and, and smile about snoring, but for those who suffer, it's an incredibly antisocial condition, and it has some serious impact from a health perspective and quality of life perspective. And in these individuals, what happens is the airway doesn't collapse, it just partially uh, closes momentarily as the tissues touch. And it's that vibratory um, action of the soft tissues hitting each other that gives rise to this loud, audible snore. 
Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got obstructive sleep apnea, which is significantly associated with a lot of comorbidity. Um, and so in this condition, what makes it very, very unique is that airway doesn't partially collapse, it completely closes. So the individual suffers this mini episode of suffocation. And we talk about sort of apneas, which are complete cessations of breathing, and they have to last for at least 10 seconds for them to count. A lesser form of respiratory disturbance is something called a hypopnea, which is a, a milder respiratory obstruction, but nevertheless is associated with a drop in um, arterial oxygen. So whether you have apneas and hypopneas, we tend to talk about obstructive sleep apnea in terms of its severity as a condition called the apnea hypopnea index. And that's a summation of the number of uh, apneas and hypopneas in any one hour of sleep. And this can range from five upwards to, well, an endless number almost, but we classify it between five and 30 as cutoffs between mild and severe. Amongst that plethora of conditions, there are milder respiratory disturbances, but that's for fundamentally, that, that's really what we're dealing with. We're dealing with an airway that's collapsing and... Um, kind of our role, dental, dental sleep medicine has really evolved. Um, so in terms of your question, you know, how did dentists get involved or what con contribution can we make? Well, the contribution is significant now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's probably taken me the best part of 25 years to, to, to really um, get that to the forefront of not only our medical colleagues, um, but the dental profession itself. Because as you quite rightly recognize that this isn't something that's um, routinely trained or taught. And there was a lot of inertia towards this initially, um, primarily because the evidence base wasn't supportive. But now we've got an immensely strong evidence base. And it's probably safe for me to say that the, the government in 2018 set up a NICE uh, committee, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, to set up guidelines for sleep-related breathing disorders. And I was quite privileged to be interviewed and, and appointed as the dental expert on that panel. And the report would have been published in May of this, this year, Mm -hmm. um, but because of its because of COVID nineteen, we've had yeah. to push that date back. So, um, I was really optimistic that by the end of this year, people would be reading an awful lot more. And we've tried to embrace the multidisciplinary nature of this condition. So, as a dental profession, if you think back to what I was saying about the collapse of this airway, the one predominant tissue that features in all of this is the tongue, mm -hmm. and nobody has better control of the tongue than than a dentist. So. You know, we're in a very, very unique position because we are the only qualified profession to get involved in this. Uh, insofar as the, the, the simple um, mechanism of action really is that if you advance your mandible, you advance your tongue. And by doing so, you stop these obstruction episodes or these intermittent collapsing. So uh, at least you resolve the snoring. At very best, we start to resolve sleep apnea. And there are some now very established international guidelines which accredit this work. Um, so we tend to follow the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Um, and they've been updated largely to reflect the amount of research that's been undertaken in this field. So we're in quite a privileged position. Um, and you know, I'm, my role has been in probably the last 10 years to really push um, dentists to get involved in this because it's, it's by far the easiest level of dentistry we actually undertake. And we can talk about what it involves. Um, well, prop, prop, but, I actually came across you and I learned about uh, the role that you're sort of playing uh, in, a, in a political and a national and a dental level within um, sleep disordered breathing when I came across your um, two part, I think, DVD series that you did with uh, S4S. Uh, yeah. And then that's where I, that, that lecture was a real eye opener for me when, I, when I'd watched it. Um, and what I want to know is why is it that uh, the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine had produced all these guidelines all these years ago. And they've been, I mean, it seems to be like a, when I speak to my American colleagues, and I actually worked in Singapore for a while and I met some American dentists and their understanding and their sort of um, perception about the role of uh, dentistry in sleep was completely different to my background. But why do you think that um, in US they're, they're way ahead? Is it because of the way insurance pays or is there something else going on? Yeah, it's again a really good question. I mean, it, I suppose at the cutting edge, really, of, of sleep medicine in general has been the Australians. Um, they take credit for an awful lot of the um, innovative technology that's taken place. Uh, and the Americans, as you quite rightly identify, have, have got onto this probably a lot, lot quicker and a lot sooner than we did. Um, I, I just think it's probably scales of economy to one extent. 
The second is, I think um, the element of funding that comes into play also is, is an issue because in the States, as you know, it's all almost privately funded healthcare. And one of the big things that takes place that differentiates the UK from America and, and other parts of the world is that insurance companies pay for an immense amount of the investigative work that takes place. So sleep physicians are often then confronted with this plethora of patients as well as conditions, which they often can't manage. And, and they were often restricted because the gold standard for treating obstructive sleep apnea is so if we just park for one minute snoring to one side and, mm -hmm. and focus on the comorbidity, because obstructive sleep apnea attracts you know, most of the attention because of its profound effect on people. So the, the treatment of choice is, is called CPAP, continuous positive airways pressure, which has been popularized during the COVID um, scenario because what this does is that basically a, a machine which takes normal air, filters it, humidifies it, and then forces it under pressure um, into the back of the throat. So if you go back to that party balloon scenario, everyone gets why it works so efficiently. It's basically a pneumatic splint. It has no other feature other than a pure anatomical role. It just literally blows the airway up. The biggest challenge they have with that treatment is compliance. So it's mm. incredibly effective, but patient compliance is, is quite poor to say the least. Um, and so consequently, these sleep physicians are either confronted with patients who are really severely ill, unwell, symptomatic, with no treatment of choice, or the patient simply looks at the device and thinks, well, there's no way I'm going to comply with that, um, even if they're at the milder end of the spectrum. And I think it made the Americans perhaps, and certainly the Australians, sit up and think, well, actually, you know, where, where are we going with this? So when I completed my PhD back in 2004, the, the Australians completed the biggest international research um, trial, which was funded by multi million pounds, looking at the effectiveness of oral appliances versus CPAP. So they were really ahead of the game. And that's a kind of a, a pinnacle paper that, you know, we really regularly um, recommend people to read. Um, so I think partly that has evolved. And then naturally, um, because of the availability of that treatment in the US and because it was a funded treatment, um, they, I suspect, have always remained ahead of the game. I wouldn't say they're particularly ahead of the game at the moment. Um, it's just that from a regulatory point of view, the UK have been behind. So once the NICE guidelines come out, we will probably have the most up-to-date guidance on the management of sleep disorder breathing. So we, we respond, but we're a little bit um, slower on that. Well, it, it's good that we're finally getting there. And for a lot of people who are listening, um, a lot of dentists, young dentists, they probably have never seen what a CPAP looks like. Now, Mark, from, from the research that I've been doing in a run-up to this episode, because I wanted to make sure I had some, some knowledge in front of you, is that um, it's not a very sexy device uh, to wear. And that may have something to do with the, the, the poor compliance. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of elements to it. The, 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 certainly, it's not the most attractive. It used to be a little bit noisy because it's like going to bed with an air conditioning unit on, but they've made that better. Um, its primary problem, from a patient point of view, is traveling with the wretched thing because mm. it is space consuming. And in, the, in these days of heightened airport security, well, former days of heightened airport security, um, in these patients used to put this in the hold all and they'd have to justify this treatment. So one of the sort of almost, I suppose, proactive elements for patients is they've come to me and say, look, I need something I can travel with or that mm -hmm. doesn't need an electricity supply because that's the other thing it's bound to. Beyond that, actually, the mask itself is incredibly uncomfortable. That's where all the issues arise for patients. It's, it's, it's got so many multiple side effects that it, it tends to be constrictive despite the millions that are invested. Brilliant. Well, then, what, what, this leads nicely to the next question. Why has... The, the dental sleep medicine, do you think become, and I, I think it's like the elephant in the room in our profession, yeah. um, especially at undergraduate level. I don't remember, remember a single lecture about the, the role of um, airway at, at the time. Has that, is that changing now? Because I know you're involved in education. Yeah. Are you now starting to teach undergra undergraduates? Well, it's interesting you say that because there's, there's not just a change needed in undergraduate dental but undergraduate medical as well has changed consequently because uh, sadly the knowledge amongst GPs and the training available to them has been rather limited as well. So I used to work a lot with primary um, sleep groups uh, to try and raise the, the, the knowledge base. So not only within dentistry, but within medicine. Um, within dentistry, there's no formal acknowledgement in the curriculum that this would be a, um, a, a key component, let's say. However, 
at Queen Mary, we, I've integrated it. Um, so I have students at the moment who do a, a selective study model, a module, a choice module, a sort of a, an elective, if you like. Um, and they kind of really enjoy it. I've had a few of them. In fact, one of them wrote um, something for the dental mouthpiece because, you know, to raise dental awareness. Um, and again, within postgraduate training, we've obviously got it going now and introduced it to basic orthodontic training. And But it, it's not just orthodontics that it affects, clearly. It, it affects any dental professional. Brilliant. Well, then... Um... Fast forward from students, which are hopefully will, you know, it will get embedded both in the medical and the dental sort of curriculum and, and looking at the dental profession as a whole at the moment. How can we help our patients who we suspect may have uh, an airway issue? Um, obviously, the, the first thing that we need to do as a profession is learn. So for me, my, my initial learning was uh, not only watching your uh, lectures, which was an eye-opener for me, but also during my DCT position at Guy's Hostel, I used to, um, I used to give some um, mandibular advancement uh, splints. These were like the, to describe it to those, it's like a, an upper and lower soft splint where the mandible is advanced and they're just sort of st stuck together. And uh, that's what, that was my initial sort of introduction to it. I then went on to um, treat snoring following the S4S framework. So we had the, um, the patient fill out the Epworth scale and uh, I, I like the sort of letter that was attached that we can send to the GP, but I never once had a GP write back to me. And to be fair, yeah. even the patients, once they got their device to help them snoring, they, they didn't pursue it with the, with the GP um, as, you know, as, as strongly as perhaps I, I would want them, want them to. So I, I guess the, the, the question I'm asking is, is it just these mandibular advancement splints that we are to eventually hopefully get involved with or is there much more to it than that and how can we take it further as a profession okay so i mean these are these are really crucial questions really because um so before i could open this let's say treatment modality to, to dentists within the uk what i did was i engaged with the sleep societies the british thoracic society the british sleep society and I kind of wrote to them all and I said, look, if I was to train dentists, would you support them in clinical practice? Because ultimately, this is a, an MDT approach. It's not something that as a dental profession, we can get in on our own and neither we would, would, would we want to. My second port of call was the defense organizations because many of them would not support or even recognize this as being treatment um, under the umbrella of dentistry. So there was kind of a huge basic educational training needed. So I managed to then demonstrate to the defense organizations that this is mainstream treatment. This is not um, peripheral care that we're offering. So they, were bought, they bought into it, but on the premise that if dentists came into this industry of dental sleep medicine, they did so on the formal understanding that it was part of a team approach and that they, they need to require, acquire the necessary sort of skill set. Hand in hand with that, what I was trying to develop with the um, sleep physicians themselves was something that as a dental profession, we can instigate and do. Because one of the luxury positions we're in, we have a humongous patient base. And we know that sleep disorder breathing is actually far, far more prevalent in the population than it is recognized. Um, so in developing a, if you like, pre-questionnaire screening tool is, is what we all agreed and they thought it was an excellent idea and overwhelmingly supported this initiative once i demonstrated that to the defense organizations that the pathway that we were setting up for dental professionals coming into this would be that firstly you would gain an understanding of sleep disorder breathing because clearly we need to understand the condition um, the analogy i sometimes give is you know if you diagnose someone as having anemia yes you might give them some iron supplement have a sort of vitamin you know, B or whatever you felt was they were short on. But fundamentally, our cause is to know why they got the anemia. What is the underlying cause of that? And same in this scenario, we can treat snoring and sleep apnea, but we need to have a better understanding that the diagnosis is established. And as a dental profession, we're not capable or indeed uh, trained to diagnose. We're not medical professionals. and We don't need to pretend to be either. What we can do, though, is with our patient base existing, we can apply some very simple screening questionnaires, one of which you re refer to, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar, this is, a, again, an, an Australian-developed um, initiative. It's um, eight basic questions which ask a patient their probability of falling asleep during daytime. And they range from zero to, to three. So you get a maximum score of 24. 
This gives us an indication of how sleepy this patient is because sleepiness, if you like, is a sort of a, a direct clinical outcome, but it's an indirect measure of what happens at night. So these patients often wake up completely fatigued. In addition, we developed one or two other questionnaires which would be pertinent to our care. So we put together this package and part of the, you referred to very carefully a minute ago, that there's a tear off which you send to the GP. So in negotiating with the defense organizations, what they wanted dentists to be trained in is one understanding of the condition, and secondly, a better understanding of what these devices do, how they work, and how you provide them. And finally, the other feature you just touched on is the sort of appropriate level of follow-up care that we instigate. So all of this is well, well, well within our capabilities, mm -hmm. but requires us to interface um, a little bit. Um, the analogy I often give is that as an orthodontist, you might refer me a patient uh, to the hospital for treatment. And my role is to provide care for that patient under your uh, umbrella of general dental care. It would be highly inappropriate for me to take that patient and then to do a filling in them as an orthodontist, not that mm -hmm. I would wish mm -hmm. to or capable of. <laughs> um, and what I would do then is I would write back to you and say, Jazz, thank you very much. Your patients had their orthodontic treatment and over to you for their continuing dental care. And the same happens in the sleep world. The sleep physicians are, if you like, the team leaders. Within that team is dentistry, an absolute second in the pecking order. It used to be ENT. ENT have progressively um, withdrawn the levels of care that they're prepared to provide because surgery out surgical outcomes aren't particularly um, beneficial long-term. Uh, sadly, there's no evidence to support the, the long-term benefits to patients despite the, the optimism of, of the procedure. So, you know, you're looking at CPAP and dental appliances. So what I, I instigate is that as dental professionals, we provide the treatment. This is really easy treatment for us to undertake, but then we give the patient and we refer the patient back to their sleep physicians accordingly. Or in some instances of snoring, we may liaise with the GP because the GP, whether or not they have more training than you do after you've been on these courses, nevertheless is medically qualified um, and therefore has the indemnity to protect the patient's care overall. That's a long-winded answer, but I hope that makes sense. No, no, but I think I like the way that you ended that question about the medical professional. Yes, they, they are the medical professional, so they need to be uh, taking a role, uh, a yeah. role that unfortunately dentists we cannot fulfill. What, 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 to give you an example, I had one patient who I helped with a mandibular um, advanced, advanced suspend after following the correct protocols of getting the you know stop bang uh, yeah. or steepness scale. Uh, and following up the patient for occlusal changes, all, all, all a lot. But my stumbling point was the lack of knowledge and training of the medical professional, GP, because my patient said to me, when I went to a GP, she looked really puzzled and confused. So in some ways, do you think there'll ever come a time where as dentists, you know, hopefully 10 years from now, where our general um, sort of involvement in this is further advanced, that we will be able to refer our patients directly to the sleep physician for a sleep test. Because the more I read, the more I'm thinking that, hang on a minute, these patients should be getting a sleep test. Okay, then that's a really good question because that now comes down to where we suspect the remit of the impending NICE guidelines will sit. Mm. The challenge we have at the moment is that the NHS does not fund in the UK um, the provision of these appliances per se. Hence, why we've probably not been at the forefront, back to your question about the states, uh, of, of, of pushing the guidelines. Where this could all change profusely is that if there is NHS funding available, now it's very much like you negotiating or contracting a patient back to me for orthodontic services. Um, you become, in primary care, the provider of the care, and you could have passage and liaison with the sleep physicians. So often I say to patients, on, uh, dentists on the course, that if you get a patient, for example, who um, comes to you with a clear diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, and for example, is managing being managed on CPAP or not managed on CPAP, they somehow gain knowledge because the other thing that there's a disjoint in is that patients do not associate dentists at all with the condition of snoring or sleep apnea. Never in a month of Sundays would they think that their dentist is the person who could help them. So that's another educational cycle we're, we're engaging with. But let's assume that a patient came into your surgery and said to you, you know, Jazz, listen, I understand um, I saw a, a brochure or something that you've advertised that you manage snoring and sleep apnea. Um, I've been treated by a sleep physician. I've been using this CPAP machine, but I, I don't tolerate it. And at the moment, I haven't got any treatment. 
Now, this is a fantastic opportunity for us as a dental profession to then engage with the sleep physicians because mm. as a sleep physician, they have a responsibility to that patient's care and they know it's unfortunately being um, uh, left in limbo, if you like. Um, so there's an immediate avenue and rapport that you start to establish and one I try and encourage you to, to, in, to embrace. It, it's very interesting, Jess, because when I talk to sleep physicians and, and I've talked to them a lot and present at conferences to them, you know, they... they, they they used to be in awe of what we could achieve. Now they know what we can achieve. And their principal question to me almost always is, where, is, where are the dentists that we can provide, who can provide this mm -hmm. care? And we mm -hmm. try and create and have available to them a list of trained dentists. And that's the key word. So we don't want, um, for our own professional stake and standards, we, we clearly don't want to get involved in this field if you haven't had that basic training. And it, it, it's, it's acquirable within a, an introductory course, which is usually a day. And these courses you identified either are commercially available through companies um, that sponsor these events and, and you know, I'm one and, and others do the same. Or alternatively and equally, we do them through the British Society of Dental Sleep Medicine. And we do these introductory courses again to get you the sort of startup skill set. Um, and equally, we work with you to try and keep you engaged and actually provide you additional training. So we have follow -up members days and, and so forth where we bring in invited speakers. So. It, it most certainly is something um, that we're working hard towards because, and the feedback, and much like you, you know, you, you're a living example of this, that the feedback I get from patients or from dental professionals who've got involved in this is, wow, you know, it, it, it's quite humbling when you get this gratitude bestowed upon you because you think, well, actually, all I fundamentally did was a basic examination, two impressions, and possibly a bite registration. And in respect, in return for that, you know, I, I've changed someone's quality of life to, to really quite an effectual level. Brilliant. Well, the, the reason I took it further and further is um, my interest uh, lies in occlusion, power function, managing my Bruxen patients. And then I came across uh, some research that actually when you treat the, the airway with, so for example, a mandibular advancement splint, that actually uh, you reduce the power functional events. Um, now, I know you are a very evidence-based orthodontist. Have you, um, do you think there is good enough evidence to support the correlation between uh, sleep disorder breathing and power function? Yeah, I mean, that's a very, very good point, Jazz. And I think, I think one thing I do like to try and dispel is that practicing evidence-based dentistry, you know, there are three pillars upon what it sits. One of them is, is, is the research. What, what does the research tell us? And that is obviously pivotally and, and important and a good resource for us. The other um, second sort of pillar, if you like, of this tripod is that it, it depends very much on your clinical experience as well, because clinical experience has an awful lot to offer. Not everything is susceptible or amenable to, you know, crucial um, microscopic level research. And the third factor in all of this is the patient's concerns and wishes. So if you think of that tripod and, and you put a patient in the middle of that and you say, okay, where's the evidence for this? So the first thing to say, the reassuring thing is there is an association, a strong association between parafunctioning habit and sleep disorder breathing. There was some very good research published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, which demonstrated that essentially what happens in these patients, if we go back to their physiology just for a moment, because their airway is obstructed, the oxygen levels are beginning to diminish. The CO2 levels are beginning to rise. This rise in CO2 can cause increased parafunctional activity. For example, the masset has been shown to increase and hyper, hyperflex and hypertense. So it then, you know, I never quite made that correlation for quite a while, actually, because anecdotally, when I started to treat in numbers of these patients. And when I was doing my PhD, patients would frequently come back to me and say, one of the observations that their dentists have noticed, noted is that they're no longer fracturing their restoration. So if you imagine the population we're treating, they've got these large amalgam MODs, which were put in, you know, back in the, back in the day, sort of four decades ago almost, very cuspal, little cuspal support, and they were fracturing these restorations. That compromised the fit of the device, but equally made more work for the, for the profession. And I hadn't really quite thought about it in those lines until I started to read this literature. And then I thought, well, actually, we are having a beneficial effect. Not only are we, by putting a splint between the teeth, stopping the fact that the teeth are contacting the teeth, but equally, if we reduce in the CO2 levels, which we clearly do, then the activity in those muscles is most definitely reduced as well. So 
you know, I, I think your your clinical experience is well supported by evidence as well. And, and it has a lot, and, and the patient feedback you're getting, if you put three together, you have a good evidence-based practice. Brilliant. So it's, it's good to know that I haven't been, uh, you know, <laughs> been brainwashing it by, by the wrong, wrong type of uh, sort of evidence, if you like. But you know, what I one thing I do do is when I whenever I prescribe such an appliance, the one that um, S4S do, I believe it's called the Sleep Well. It's got the the metal portion, and then they come back with all these scratches in the in the metal, to which which is obviously them in a lateral sort of a yeah. left to right sort of power function. So I I like to take a photo. I'm a, I'm a geek like that. I like to take a photo of those scratches, and I show the patient and and all that sort of stuff. Stuff, but uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's very interesting in that so I mean for those listening and watching right now I'm thinking you realize already that there's so much more to this that this episode should really be like something to whet your appetite and I think I, I'm certainly waiting for these guidelines to, to come out I think wow what a great thing that will be for our profession in the UK to take things forward the other thing Jazz I think is often people ask me you know as a dentist should I get involved in this and one of the things I can say with absolute confidence, and I don't say a lot of things with absolute confidence, but this I can say to you, is that when you go into any innovation in dentistry, you know there's always a learning curve. We're on the, you, you never want to get into something when we're on the, on, on the climbing bit of that learning curve because no one wants to be a guinea pig and no one's patient when they're paying for treatment wants to be at that end of the spectrum. We've, we've got a very much of a plateau environment at the moment because when I first started in this field, I was inundated from dentists, um, technologists around the world with devices that were being designed literally month on month. And they'd say to me, would you, would, you, would you like to trial this device? I can safely say that's all stopped. And it's stopped because we've reached relatively a happy medium. And we're at this point, what I term as third generation devices, the device that you referred to earlier is almost a first generation device. So what makes us so powerful and so effective at the moment is that we can offer a device to a patient which if you imagine, if you put anything into someone's mouth, it's foreign, it's uncomfortable, we're treating adults, they're not particularly warm to it. Add to that a protrusion of their mandible. Now you've got the ability to cause the muscle discomfort, toothache, and all the other added symptoms. And if you're treating a snorer, you've just given them enough motivation to not use your device. Where we've arrived at now is that we fit these devices in relatively neutral position. There's no protrusion added to them. There's no necessary need for it. And this was taken really from CPAP because what we realized in CPAP is that no patient arrives, gets a diagnosis of sleep apnea and has a pressure of, let's say, 10 centimeters of water whacked on them because that would be immensely high and literally intolerable. So what they do is they build up the pressure as the patient adapts to it. And that's exactly what we've copied. So we have what's called titratable mandibular devices. And there's a really good, solid evidence base for this now. And patient acceptance is phenomenal it really is good because we've we've almost minimized the unwanted effects bar one um, but the majority are not encompassing or experiencing that level of discomfort that was 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 hand in hand with the initial treatment so from that point of view i would say to the you know dentists getting involved definitely good time and you'd be amazed at the kind of outcomes you get I've been oh, I've been very happy. So my patients are happy, so I'm happy. But it's a, I think it's an area I do want to still learn more about uh, and how I can take it further. So I am cautious when I can't, you know um, when I prescribe this appliance. I know that still it's an area developing within our profession. And like you said, sometimes being an early adopter uh, and that and now it's reaching a plateau, which is which is which is good to know. But um, I, I had just a, a few more questions now because I sure. think people are realizing okay, this is going to be like a, something to whet their appetite. But some people may have come across this term. Uh, I came across it from USA. Orthodontists marketing themselves as airway friendly orthodontists. And when I, when I looked in further into this, these are orthodontists which are, the type of treatment they're doing is very much a, a MARP or SARP. For so those listening, that's micro implant assisted, rapid plat platal expansion um, or surgically assisted. Uh, is that overkill or is that strong? Is that good evidence that that is the way to be more you know, comprehensive treating the, the patient as a whole rather than just um, the standard orthodontics if you, if you like? Yeah, I think this is, this is good. This, there is a degree of controversy about this topic. So the first thing I would say is that we need to distinguish two patient populations here. What we've been primarily talking about is our adult population. So we're talking about individuals over the age of, age of 18. Otherwise, we're talking about young patients. And when the young patients, we're going from children up to 18, let's say. The reason we have the distinguishing features is primarily a reflection of growth and growth potential. 
So in the world of the adult therapy, which is where we primarily train the dental professions and, and dentists, is because there's very little variability in that field. It's a safe environment because you're not dealing with an adult who's growing, likely to encompass different changes and responses to treatment. It's pretty fairly predictable. Generally, I would always recommend that uh, as a dentist, you don't go into the field of young people's treatment, because, especially with any sort of sleep disorder, um, primarily because you've really got to have a very, very, very good grasp of the underlying tissues and the response of these tissues to age change alone, let alone the treatment modality. So I recently was invited to speak at an international meeting where my remit <laughs> was pre um, let's say adolescent and pre-adolescent. And the, the, the goal I was given is address the question you've just asked me. Can SARP, should SARP be undertaken? And surgically, assisted, surgically assisted expansion is largely reserved for the adult population. So now you're expanding palates in adults, but surgically. Um, the thing I would say to any clinician, um, Jazz, uh, be orthodontist, be dentist, be, be under the whole umbrella of dentistry is you know if you undertake something then you know nothing is free for in life if you're going to expand somebody's jaws quite considerably as well you have to do it yes there may be um, a change and it's been shown that there is an improvement in the airway passage through the nasal passages and that's a distinguishing feature we need to make if you improve the passage of air through the nasal passages, that does not, by definition, guarantee that the back of the throat, the airway tube that we're referring to, gets the benefit. So yes, you'll deliver more oxygen to that site of obstruction. Versus, if you go back to the child patient, if you start to treat, we do this treatment modality, as you probably know, this is why you've got orthodontic friendly ones, is that all they've done is they've if you like, expanded their role, inverted commas. So this um, rapid maxillary expansion therapy or palatal expansion or splitting of the palate is largely reserved for children who have bilateral crossbites. So what you have to picture now is if you've got a child or an adult sitting there with a normal occlusion and you split their palate, and we're talking about a centimeter to, to affect a change, you're now going to leave them with bilateral scissor bites. Mm -hmm. So functionally, they're going to be in a very, very bad place and potentially go on to develop other symptoms and signs, which are not going to be very helpful. So I would hand on heart, ear people towards caution in that respect. Um, there are markets within America, within Europe, uh, and other parts of the world where they do this fairly, um, what I would call almost gun-ho approach, where they, they're, 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 they're quite convinced by their evidence that this is effective and yes as i said there is some good evidence to support short-term benefits but always there are some complication risk factors which can be quite considerable in a growing patient that you've got to bear in mind and secondly you've got to think long term for this patient population group because you know they are growing so Initially, I thought you were going to pose me that there are orthodontists who say they're airway friendly and they're providing this treatment. And I was going to say, well, yeah. orthodontists, you know, feel comfortable with this because we provide functional appliances for children. So this is an extension of a functional appliance in an adult, if you like. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think and also, you know, the GDC are very, very um, <laughs> uh, focused on us advertising within our capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and competences. So I think you've got to be very cautious promoting yourself. But certainly if you train in dental sleep medicine, you know, that is bona fide, recognized training. Um, so I, I think for anyone coming into this profession, I would always err them on the side of caution, say, stay safe initially, get some experience behind you. And then the world is a more exciting place. Treating snorers, for example, is far, far less challenging than treating sleep apnea patients and can be incredibly just as rewarding in that respect. I don't know where well, that answers um, the... No, it, 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 it does, and, and, and that makes sense. Um, but related to that, when I, wanted, when I was uh, looking more into some lecture series by a very eminent orthodontist in, in USA, they showed case reports of, or cases they treated of adults who had premolar extractions uh, when they were younger as a first round of orthodontics, and then now they were opening up these spaces again to place implants in to improve the airway. Yeah. Now, it, what what that what 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 question that leads to for me is: Is there any strong evidence to suggest that 
premolar extractions adversely affects the airway? In a simple word, no. Um, what we have to always be conscious of, and this goes back to these three pillars of evidence-based practice, you can always you can always look for literature that might support or in part um, support your practice, and you have to be slightly careful interpreting that. So this whole the, the, the challenge they've got in the states is that the, the whole uh, provision of orthodontic care is in the private sector. And there are many, many competing interests. Um, aside of the dental professionals getting involved in orthodontics, so um, there's the orthodontist, then there's the pediatric dentists who are doing this, and every other profession is doing a version of. So somehow they're trying to reinvent themselves. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense if you were to say to a patient, well, if I take teeth out in your mouth, I'm going to make your jaw smaller. If I make your jaw smaller, I'm going to impinge on your tongue. What I can safely say to you is that even in patients in the opposite extreme where we try and open up the airway quite considerably, let's talk about the RME we said, we're expanding those patients a centimeter across their palate. Now an extraction is going to achieve at best millimeters, small millimeters, two to three millimeters of expansion at very best. So where we expand them a centimeter, 10 millimeters, we're only affecting a small change in the nasal passage of air, measured very objectively and very reliably scientifically. So then to extrapolate that and say, well, actually, if you extract teeth, by definition, closing the door, jaw, like, uh, transverse dimension, you're going to exacerbate um, snoring problems. It, it kind of doesn't really add up. And if I went one further than that and said to you, we really tested this theory by actually taking patients with a class three jaw, breaking their jaw, doing an osteotomy for them, because as you know, we treat class threes. One of the things we were interested to know is if you treated a class three patient, broke their jaws and moved the jaw back, naturally you're impinging on the tongue space quite considerably. Mm -hmm. Do we create in these patients snoring and sleep apnea? And the short and midterm results were no, we didn't. So where we physically are moving the jaws that much, we don't impinge on it. The, the thing about the airway and its collapse is that no one, tr one treatment modality addresses all patients, and this is the complexity of it. It's, it's multifactorial, it's anatomical, so CPAP hits that theory. All appliances have their effect on the anatomy, but there's also a strong underlying physiological tendency back to the muscles again. And this is where there are emerging schools of thought at the moment about using uh, muscle stimulation exercises or electrical stimulation. So there's a number of multi-center studies going on around the world looking at this. And these have shown some exciting results in selective populations. In other words, there are those patients who have the physiological problem, but not necessarily the anatomical problem. And this is why the results tend to be slightly varied when you look at outcomes. All appliances Generally speaking, we do incredibly, incredibly well because we've shown that their role is not just anatomical. There is a physiological action to them. We do stimulate upper airway dilatory muscle activity. Um, and so we kind of hit a, a number of spheres and vectors. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's <laughs> it, that, that space is definitely evolving. Brilliant. And so the, the last question, uh, Prof, I have for you is just based on my own observations and something that, you know, I, 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 sp I spoke to some of my listeners. And I said, look, I'm getting Prof, Prof Johal on. Uh, any, any questions for him? And, and one of the questions I got was, I sometimes see children with large tonsils and signs of mouth breathing. Should I be concerned? And what, what can I do about that? And that is a very good question because, so this is where the nasal passage does and potentially can have an impact on, on mouth breathing and possibly obstructive sleep apnea as well. So this is what I was saying to you, that there are snippets of research which are very relevant to this field as well. So if you have a child with enlarged tonsils or adenoids, typically that will cause, and as you probably remember back to your BDS days, dare I remind you of them, but lymphoid tissue follows a very specific growth curve away from somatic growth general growth. And lymphoid tissue, um, if you like, accelerates up to pu puberty and then starts to shrink away. So this is why tonsils and adenoids were routinely being removed in that adolescent phase because children would obstruct or snore quite profusely. And, you know, TNAs, as it was called, tonsils and adenoids was a routine procedure. 
So the reality is, if the back of the nasal passage is blocked, then the child does become a mouth breather. The problem for us as a mouth breathers is that humans are obligatory nasal breathers. So if we breathe through our mouth, our jaw is lowered by definition, and that potentially can impinge on tongue space, which potentially then can cause sleep disorder breathing. So there is this relationship most definitely there that we wouldn't deny. Um, and so in children, for example, if you're suspicious of this, it is certainly worth getting an ENT opinion. Um, because again, it's an invasive procedure. And as you probably know, the government changed the guidelines uh, in early 2019 regarding tonsils and adenoids. So most of us as a dental profession are more likely now to engage and encourage or see, observe, I should say, patients with enlarged tonsils and adenoids because they're not routinely being removed. If you do have that concern, my first, the first protocol would be to refer them for an ENT. Uh, and via just, the GP, right? That'll be via, via the, GP? the GP. Yes, of course. Sorry. Yes. Because the GPs are the gatekeepers of the, the, of the commission of the, of the fund, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and just again, just to elaborate, just to show you the, the potency of this intervention in children, first line strategy for sleep disorder breathing uh, and snoring and sleep apnea is to consider removing tonsils and adenoids. That, that is how high and pivotal it is. So I think you made a really good point, really. And that is something, again, as a dental profession, we can certainly be um, observant of. And I think as a, you know, certainly some years ago, I, I was not looking for this stuff as actively. It's only through learning more and developing more of an interest that I'm actually um, observing for the signs uh, and the role that the tongue plays in the sort of expansion of the uh, maxilla. Uh, so it's really quite interesting. And I think the, I, we, we, we can sort of conclude that watch this space in terms yeah. of um, airway and how as dentists we can get more and more uh, involved. Uh, Prof, are there any uh, final things that you'd like to, you know, you have the microphone to general dentists in the nation uh, and the world. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, firstly, I would implore you to get involved. I, I, I think it would just only enrich your practice, add variety to your day. Um, it, as and when you choose to get involved, look for a, um, a certified course and that will provide you that basic introductory level and ongoing support as well. Um, and, and certainly if you're in the UK, yeah, let's um, await the, the publication of the res- this report. But irrespective of what this report says, this, this, these patients are not going to go away and they're just as demanding and needing of care. Um, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd implore you to get involved. And I'm very, very happy to, to front, you know, front, questions um and and people to get in touch with me as well but we we're pushing hard to develop the academy um, and the association the british society for dental sleep medicine so that would be an excellent protocol as well well what i'd love from you prof is if you don't mind just emailing me a few links perhaps that i could leave as a, yeah. as the footnote uh, to this podcast episode for dentists who i think a lot of dentists will be interested in because this is an area that generally a lot of dentists feel like they're very uncomfortable with. Uh, they don't sure. know enough. So I think there's a lots of hungry dentists for knowledge. So if you can provide a few uh, resources, whether it's, you know, be the you know, British Academy of you know, Dental Sleep or um, private companies, whatever, just anywhere where you can gain some knowledge, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. I'll happily do that. Well, thank you so very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank it's you. been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, there we are. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I'm, I'm sure it was uh, something very different. I hope you found some some useful takeaway points about the role of airway. Perhaps you're going to start introducing this to your practice. Uh, so I want to th- say thanks to Matt Everett, who helped me get in touch with Prof. Emma Johal. Uh, and they've got some airway uh, online courses. So I'm going to put a link to that. There is a 50% discount until the end of August, I am told, from Matt. So this is the course that I did when I started to prescribe the Sleep Well appliances. So I'll put that in the on the website site protrusive.co.uk forward slash airway so that if you're interested you can you can join that and when the nice guidelines are out i'll also stick it on on that web page dedicated to the episode so thanks again for joining me uh, i think next episode i will let you guys decide i have you know the fact that this is recorded in april you get an idea that actually i have got a bit of a backlog um i'm in a sort of good position i've got so much awesome content ready to go it's just about finding the time and actually spreading it out a little bit so the next episode you will get to decide what it is so watch the instagram that's at jazzy gulati and the protrusive dental community so if you're like if you really enjoy the podcast uh, and you want to get involved more with the, the people who listen to the podcast then join the protrusive dental community facebook group because these are two places that i'll be putting the polls so you can decide which episode will be next so thanks so much for listening and i'll catch you in the next one